Here's it going, a real life Peter Griffin here, welcoming you guys to another exciting episode of Art 101 with Mr. Burger. Freaking sweet. It'll be hard for me to pick my favorite artist or artwork. It's going to be Angel Adams and Moonrise over Hernandez. Freaking sweet. <laughs> art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Hello again, scholars, and welcome back to yet another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to bring you the best in art historical content. I painted the truth. I painted my truth. Now, if you like this one or others in the series, please make sure you uh, interact with the video. Give me a subscribe. Give me a thumbs up. It goes a long way, and I appreciate it greatly. Thank you very much for that. Roadhouse. So, as the weather's getting nicer out there, it makes me think about photography, getting out there and and creating uh, with my camera. And I don't think it takes a stretch of the imagination for us to gravitate toward photographers like Ansel Adams, who create these great landscape works. And most of us, when we think of photography, synonymous with photographer is the work of Ansel Adams and so today what I'd like to do as you know because you clicked on the video we're gonna talk about Ansel Adams so without further ado let's do it Ansel Adams was a photographer and environmentalist originally from California he came from a fairly wealthy family of timber barons that would lose all of their wealth after the financial panic of 1907. During the great earthquake of 1906, at the age of only four, he was thrown to the ground and he would have a severely broken nose that would change his appearance for the rest of his life. This doesn't look very good. Oh, this doesn't look very good at all. He was a naturally shy kid and grew into a naturally shy adult. Growing up, he had troubles fitting in, and they believed that he suffered from dyslexia. His struggles in a formal education environment caused his father and aunt to bring him home to be tutored. He would have gained the equivalent to an 8th grade education through his formal studies. But all along, he loved nature. He loved to walk the trails and the sand dunes around San Francisco, California. During his first visit to the Yosemite National Park, he was given his first camera at the age of 12, using a Kodak number no. 1 box brownie that he would use on hikes and climbs, exploring the Yosemite Valley and joining the Sierra Club. And this is also where he would meet his future wife, Ultimately, they would be married in 1928 and have two children. Oh, giggity, 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 goo. Now, the Sierra Club was vital to his success as a photographer. This gave him the ability to publish photographs in their bulletins and access to outings and trips that would give him the ability to capture images that he wouldn't have otherwise been able to capture, just walking around on his own. He had quite a bit of interest in music, but ultimately gave that up for photography. Basically, from 1916 until his death in 1984, he would travel the country visiting locations to be photographed and explored. In the 1920s, his photographs began to sell enough that he could earn enough money to survive. In 1927, he would meet up with fellow photographer Edward Weston. They would become great friends and found the group F64 in 1932, and the work with this group would also lead to his first one-man show that year. The group F64 was a group of photographers that was truly interested in advocating for pure photography without effects or anything of that nature. It was just purely the capturing of great images using spot-on technique. He would rapidly gain popularity in the 1930s as he would meet more and more artists and show in more and more exhibitions and one-man shows during this time. It's go time. 
Wait, now what the hell was that? That's what you do, Lois. Throughout the 1930s, he spent a lot of time as a commercial photographer, working for clients such as the National Park Service, Kodak, IBM, AT&T, Life, Fortune, Arizona Highways Magazine, and more and more and more. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh yeah! In 1941, Mr. Adams was asked to make some photographs of the national parks, Indian reservations, and other locations by the National Park Service. He was contracted for a 180-day assignment, and so he set off on the road to capture as many of these things as he possibly could. During this time, he would venture through New Mexico. Now, Peter made mention of Moonrise over Hernandez, New Mexico, as his favorite piece of artwork. Now, let's explore that a little bit more, but I think the story would best be told by Ansel Adams himself. I was driving along and looked up and saw this rather incredible sight. The, uh, the moon's about oh, two or three days from full rising up over this little village with the white crosses. And I nearly ditched the car and kept yelling to all my friends to get me this and get me that, and setting up the camera and the lenses. Then I couldn't find the exposure meter. And uh, then we went on. I was composing, and I just remembered that the moon was 250 candles per square foot. And that gave me the key to the exposure. So I made the exposure with the G filter on an 8x10 film, and I knew I had something good. I wanted to make a duplicate. I turned the film holder around, and as I pulled the slide, the light went off the crosses. And it was a very, very discouraging moment. I had just this one picture of what I knew was quite a considerable thing quality of the light that was late in the fall, the quality was extremely beautiful. It was just one of those incredibly fortunate accidents that do happen sometimes. And I often wonder how many, how many pictures have been lost just because the, the, uh, the accident happened to go the wrong way. This photographic print would be put on display at the Museum of Modern Art in 1944. The project was ended in 1942, but never realized because of World War II. Well, this was a lot of effort for nothing. He did submit 225 prints and 229 negatives to the Department of the Interior, because during this time he was working not only for the National Park Service, but also for other commissions such as Standard Oil, and some days reserved for his own personal work. We could go to the Grand Canyon. Now, Adams was really great at keeping very meticulous records as far as his travel and expenses, but was far less disciplined when it came to taking into account who was paying for him to work on what given day. This caused a question of who actually owned the time that he created this Moonrise image. It ended up being determined that this particular photograph was captured on November the 1st, 1941, and this was a day that he was not being billed by the Department of the Interior, and so it completely belonged to Ansel Adams himself. Although he was best known for his landscape photography, he did occasionally photograph other subjects. For example, after the outbreak of World War II, Adams was photographing at internment camps, detailing the experience of Japanese Americans that were forced into these camps. He would donate his collection of over 200 images to the Library of Congress in 1965. He wanted to show their suffering and the injustices that they were living under, and he wanted to document this so that the government would know exactly what they were doing to these people, so the problem could be corrected. In the 50s and 60s, he would work more on collections of photos that would be used in books and exhibitions of a more historical significance. In 1980, then-President Jimmy Carter would award Ansel Adams with the Presidential Medal of Freedom the highest honor that any civilian can receive from the President of the United States. After his death, his body was cremated and his ashes were scattered at the Half Dome at Yosemite National Park. 
Ansel Adams is unique that his name is truly synonymous with photography and what it is to be a photographer. Throughout his very long career, he was able to create many, many negatives of really great places. However, he was unable to make every single one of these negatives into an actual print. At the time of his death, he would leave behind over 40,000 negatives in old shoe boxes in his home that were never made into prints. What do I know, friends? I color for a living, but I love that story. Thanks for letting me share it with you. I can't believe I ever wanted you here in the first place. You're messy, you're loud, and thanks to you we've got a recurring flea problem.